Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, so our next presenter is someone who barely even needs an introduction at a conference like this. Milton Mermikides is a lecturer at the University of Surrey. He's a composer, an academic, a writer, an electronic musician, and a guitarist from London. And he's going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, the quote unquote idiosyncratic pitch matrix of the fretboard. His uh, presentation is titled Digital Self-Sabotage, Remapping the Fretboard with MIDI Guitar and Max for Pedagogy, Composition, and Performance. Thank you, Milton, for being here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for putting this together. Um, an incredible team, really. Um, so this is about uh, the fretboard as a musical interface and the use of MIDI guitar and, and Max MSP to remap and break uh, the fretboard's auditory motor connections, really. A quote from Rosenwinkel and D'Souza is to hear the music directly. And um, it started off, off as a way of doing such a thing, but then it has evolved in the last few days, really, into something which actually provides uh, musical insights as well. So this is a somewhat autobiographical and perhaps a confessional presentation about the fretboard. I have uh, admittedly an unusual background. I learned the guitar having fallen in love with Hendrix and hearing the Hendrix chord and his chord soloing technique. Uh, and I developed theoretical systems before I understood what notation was. So I've got, there's three distinct areas um, we all have, and that's a sort of abstract syntax about chords and scales, um, pitch visualization on the stave, and then the actual execution, in our case, the fretboard. And they act as uh, translation systems between each other, sometimes quite strongly, um, and in other times, and in certainly in my case, weakly. If I just um, explain, if I were to see this, particularly after my hard training at Berklee College of Music, really F major 9 sharp 11 is conceptualized as F and um, major 9 sharp 11. Um, the F I find and major 9 sharp 11 is this object here and I stick them together. This of course could be mapped on the um, on the stave but even though I've learned to read music, it's an uneasy connection between the fretboard and the stave. And when I read music or write it down, it seems to have to buy, it doesn't go directly to the stave, it bypasses via this abstract connective system. Now, I blame myself for this for years and thought that I was a poor student or a poor musician, but in my defense, um, the stave is an unusual object with inconsistencies. And despite my hard work at the guitar, uh, it's one of my first lessons was, was with Brett Wilmot, who I don't know if anyone's been through his complete book of harmony theory and voicings, but it, um, it's a really deep training of the fretboard and the idi and the, in its idiosyncratic standard tuning. And I worked everything out on that fretboard. I worked out what a fifth was and a major third was not on the stave, but on what we would call Leithwood's abacus, the fretboard itself. And such exercises, seeing the shape as F major seven flat five or do minus six nine or G nine 13 or on and on and on, uh, allowed this deep connection between the abstract world and the fretboard but not so much with the conventional pitch surface of the uh, stave. I recently had three important insights about the fretboard. One was how deeply ingrained it was in me. I did a project with UCL Neuroscience where I improvised in, in an MRI scanner on a plastic fretboard and I also did it in my head without actually moving my fingers. And they could find my fingers basically in my brain. So um, 
as much as I was playing the guitar, the fretboard was playing my brain. I also am deep into electronic music and I have this push too. And I realized only recently that when I played chords on its grid surface, I would avoid notes on the same row. You can still play notes on the same row, but um, because the fretboard was so instilled, I just presumed it had this limited polyphony on there. So the fretboard provides this invisible constraint. And lastly, I remember being at a party and picking up a left-handed guitar and playing upside down and being bemused at first and then being able to play. And it's, it was a joyful experience that somehow reconnected with that innocent, naive moment when I first discovered the Hendrix chord. And I didn't know what it was, but I could hear it directly. So let's talk about the uh, stave for a moment. We assume that it's this clean, abstract representation of um, pitch space. But if you look at it closely, hidden are these inconsistencies. If we know that C is in this space right in the middle of it, and D is above it, and B below it, you realize that there is a tone between C and D and a semitone between B and C. And this inconsistency spreads all across the stave and we just assume to know it. In fact, an honest stave would, would map onto our fretboard and um, piano, but it doesn't fit however we try. It doesn't fit on the piano once, but it doesn't fit on the guitar six times. An honest stave, in fact, would look like this with semitone grid lines showing these um, correct gappings. So it's no wonder that some guitarists like me have trouble marrying these two languages, particularly because the fretboard, as Amy will attest, is anomalous. It's a broken, limited poly polyphony overlapping dual interval space with interval class fives and with a four thrown in, like someone whispering numbers at you as you're trying to write down a phone number. And um, as Goodrick says, uh, every, the average note has 2.8 locations and 9.2 fingerings. I've mapped out a chromatic scale for each color here to show this um, strange anomaly pitch surface. If we move the fretboard, you can see it starts looking like a Bridget Riley print. Beautiful, but you understand that this is something that we're holding as guitarists in our minds and have to somehow juggle, particularly because we have to do it over several octaves. And so this is really what we're holding in our mind. This is our pitch surface. And this fret fretboard sits uneasily. And I think it sits in servitude to the inherited importance of stave and piano-based um, pitch musical language. So this is where the MIDI guitar comes in. The MIDI guitar is developed, of course, to extend the sounds available to the guitarist. But in its digitization of pitch, we can somewhat decouple from this diatonic and um, uh, n naming and nomen nomenclature of that we guitarists have inherited. So um, just to show here, what I have is a MIDI guitar and I've got it running into the system. I've got it uh, just playing audio. audio. Hopefully you can hear that. And because each string has this little pickup and it can recognize the pitch, it can um, 
it can just demonstrate not only the pitch I'm playing, but what string it's on. I developed this just to teach over, um, over Zoom with the pandemic. But as with many things, uh, pedagogy and analysis and performance and improvisation can blend together. So, so I could demonstrate not just in the on the piano, but on the fretboard, all, all, all what I was demonstrating far better than the camera picks up. Of course, because um, it's MIDI, I can send these to um, whatever sounds I want and um, and be somewhat of an avatar um, which you end up playing differently and uh, re um, uh, discovering what these chords mean and you're gonna have super fun with all this stuff but that's for another time um, let's talk about the fretboard itself so um, one thing we can consider is um, the idea of a more consistent pitch surface or pitch representation than we get with um, than we get with the stave Something like um, the Bach circle or the chromatic circle or the tonnets itself. And I'll show these really quickly. I started to basically hack the um, MIDI stream so that I could represent um, not just uh, the fretboard, but um, uh, pitch class sets. And I would learn them everything and all the trichords and all interval tetrachords. I discovered, by the way, that the, um, the Hendrix chord, and I knew there was a reason why I loved it, the uh, Hendrix chord is an all interval tetrachord, which is good to know. And so that these um, objects in space would be, um, uh, would give me the pitch class sets and I could think beyond um, the standard harmony and just start discovering sunshine chords and start to think of them as entities in their own right. And here's the Hendrix chord. You can see it's got all intervals represented. In fact, I built this little thing which assigns for each interval class a value. So you can tell how scrunchy a chord is. So a nice triad is weak. Was. And I realized that actually my altar chords are kind of weak. I can't, so I've, I've been trying to try get the biggest number I can. 75 I'm up to. Uh, anyway, I'm working on trying to get the scrunchiest chord I can mathematically. The tonnets as well is a useful way of thinking about these chords, not just in diatonic space, but also how they might connect. And we can even investigate the hexatonic collections, which should appear as bands. But all of these are still not privileging the fretboard. They're an alternative notation. What happens if we put the fretboard itself as the central interface of our musical dialect? Such as um, Martino's use of hexagrams to represent, the, um, to represent which strings you play. Enter the D'Souza phone, uh, which is only two weeks old, but here she is. Um, this 
represents all of my sounds. I'll put it on a middle sound here. Which you can use to practice, but also I've, I'm able to block string so they won't sound. So I can practice my A Lydian on these, um, a sort of Mick Gridrick approach. Or I can do any of these 64 um, permutations of strings on and off. In fact, in my Martino phone here, I can just start um, having presets of string constraints and try and play the blues without using those strings just run through them or randomize them. What's quite nice also is that I've, I can even paint out areas, my favorite areas, so I can practice, but still avoid, but I'm not allowed to hit this one here. So pedagogically, this kind of connects to their limit and constraint aspect of, um, of of jazz guitar. It can also, of course, change the tuning. I've got something here named after Sam Muir, the Muira, which can do re-entrant tuning. And even rotate the strings round. scramble them up. So really fun and uh, do our standard odd tunings. Uh, Dad Gad it or our Aunt Law fourths. So that it's it's weirdly consistent. It still hurts me to cross this barrier with the same shape, but it's good. It's good for me. And um, also physically impossible tunings, like this cluster. Which is really great when you're writing, composing for unusually tuned instruments in an instant. You can retune to these. This, of course, connects us to um, Jonathan D'Souza and the idea of a voluntary self-sabotage, which Rosenwinkel uh, achieves in his Zivago track, which I can just bring up here as a... All these lovely... voicings, which he used to break that tight auditory motor connection um, between his knowledge and his playing. He felt like he knew too much about what he was doing and not hearing the music directly. And this sort of sabotage is really effective. And we can do this uh, to any um, tuning that we desire, even randomized ones here. And it's really liberating to play your familiar shapes and have this world um, emerge from it. Um, what's also possible is for us to think of the fretboard as a dual interval space, a uh, consistent one. For example, we could put, um, we could lay these out into major thirds. And we can even lay the fretboard, not in our familiar interval class one, but interval class, uh, let's call it, Let's do it as three. Okay. 
which allows an access to this sort of piece of music. Now, I would only access this sort of music through the score and probably never. But in this system, it allows me to think of the fretboard as my play pen for the So I own the music more closely than if it had to be filtered through the, um, through the score. Uh, a couple of things I will just present is this idea that um, not only can we um, play these frets at different um, um, interval classes, we can even um, extend them upwards so that they um, are geom geometrically expanded. I'm going to add a little day uh, delay to it so you can hear. So this is a technique used by Gershwin at the beginning of I Got Rhythm. And we can do such a thing. And we can do such a thing here. And it matches it exactly. So this um, puts us in the realm of the impossible, the negative frets and delayed intentions to our music. Um, I'm going to end just by showing this insight I had when I was messing with this world and the idea of a negative um, expansion. You'll notice that the, the phrase comes back. But if I play something like this, it'll come back in a inverted form. And I just happened to find out that E major works really well. It's, this is just a response to what I'm playing upside down. And the reason is, is that some scales are palindromic. If I invert around Dorian, for example, C Dorian, then I get all the notes in C Dorian. D Phrygian gives me B flat Ionian. And I also discovered that this works with F sharp Dorian. So. its related modes like Alidian. And there are other palindromic scales. So in conclusion, declarative knowledge, 
knowing what we play and its manifestation on the fretboard is double-edged. It provides us with fluency, options and proficiency, but this knowledge can lead to a hindering of the relationship to the music and not hearing the music directly. Technology from simple retuning, extended chordophone engage engagement to some of the techniques displayed here may create beneficial shocks to the system. This rebooting can regain the immediacy and joy of discovery when we started on the guitar and offer musical insights which can carry over to our unsabotage practice. This demonstrates the complex and symbiotic interaction of abstracted knowledge, cognition, visualization, and embodiment. It's the end, I'm just playing here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Milton. That was brilliant. Just about made it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to open the floor for questions. If people are on Facebook, you can just ask them there. Um, and if there's anyone in the room who wants to ask a question, just open your microphone. Milton, I might ask you to stop sharing your screen, though, so we can see you. Um, but I was curious, you mentioned in the middle of, oh, I'll let Renault uh, ask a question first. Yes. Uh, first of all, I was so impressed by what you just did. Uh, I think you, you, if I'm right, you kind of, you were improvising with your negative self. Yeah, exactly. Basically, I play, I'm playing F sharp and it's coming back upside down, rotated around C. And it really feels like I'm um, improvising myself in beyond looping because I'm not sure what's coming out. Did you try with other modes? Do you yeah, so I can do. Every, I, I've kind of worked out every mode that I can do it with. If if it wants to be in the same mode, uh, I mapped it out. I went through it quite quickly. But if it's rotated around C, then I can list you the uh, twenty eight modes that <laughs> it will work with. Um, but it was really interesting because like I, if I play a low note, I get a high note back. Um, there it is, you see. And it's, it seems to respond to me in a way that looping doesn't, basically. Yeah, and I was curious to know, because uh, this is kind of very uh, mathematic kind of approach to it's like a really maths kind of brain. And I was thinking like, then this is probably how you know computers that mimic box style work they kind of have like markov chains that kind of calculate the percentage of anyway I, so I, I was thinking while you were talking and and telling myself well like what is human anymore like what is our human experience yeah i mean this is actually <laughs> i mean and the, this is entirely human the approach and the reason i the reason i showed those inverted um systems is that i was just messing around and i didn't plan and built this so i could jam with myself upside down a bar later yeah. i was just messing out with what could i do if i if i just think if i just deconstruct what the fretboard is and it was a complete in joyful discovery that i played i just played something like this couldn't believe it and then I worked out why is that why do some notes sound good and then I then I then I worked it out so it was out of heuristic jamming essentially um, not through a master plan and okay. that it came it came about um, but uh, to, to be honest the first thing was just to show the fretboard that was the first thing so when I was teaching so it was out of necessity and I thought well um, I want to get one of those notes to up an octave so I can do a closer harmonies. So it was a practical demonstration and then it, all these other things emerged from it. All right, well, thank you. Your, your presentation was awesome. I loved it. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have an online question from Patrick O'Reilly. Could you explain a little more about how the scronchometer rating is calculated? Uh, it's, I, it's, like, it's actually the scrunchometer. I think we should get the <laughs> uh, So the scrunchometer is um, 
again I put a little too much in there so I'd like to have spent more time on it but basically if you know uh, interval vectors what they do for any harmonic object is they provide the number of um, uh, the number of interval class one two three four five six and basically I just assign a value so interval class one this um, oh I better turn off the uh, backward stuff um, is uh, it's the highest value and then the fifth and octave or fifth is the lowest value interval class five and then so it just adds them up basically and I'm trying to get as many as I can I, I'm going to get try and get the highest a value of scrunchy notes which is another way of uh, equally valid way of thinking about dissonance really um, we also have a comment from online uh, from Andrew Noseworthy he writes I especially appreciate the combo of theory slash intellectual slash complexity but also practicality application and tangibility here lots of places to go in a deep dive but instantly grasping what's happening too um, and I was wanted to follow up that up with the question of are you using this already in your uh, teaching you mentioned that you're using part of it um, but do you see this as having a pedagogical application especially for advanced students who are maybe really so, deeply ingrained in their patterns it's a good question I mean I still think there's a barrier of entry even though they're really affordable MIDI guitars but I think there's a barrier of entry just to have max MSP however uh, that's always going to prevent a sort of wide-scale adoption of any of these things um, uh, okay so there's, there's so there's many ways for it I use those tools and the tonnets and so on for teaching on the piano as well as on the guitar and it's more demonstrating visualizing concepts rather than a student using them directly however I would love to develop a guitar learning system that is deeply embedded with this so that you could just work on a random position and string set and then um, and uh, just uh, and just through this principle of limit and variation create this uh, a really informed pedagogy but I, I think that still like I'm a nerd and I've got this stuff uh, but I think it does feed back into normal life as well. We have a question from Sam Cave here. Hi, Milton. Nice to see you again. Um, from one word to from one nerd to another, I salute you. Uh, but uh, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder whether you you started by talking about the stave and and stave notation, and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about uh, the. I mean, perhaps that was just a starting point for growing some of this, but but perhaps you could say a little bit more about the relationship between this and, and the stave and, and what applications you found or would like to trial in your teaching related to the reading uh, of staff notation and getting that onto the fingerboard in a, in a, in a good oh, way. That's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, when I was doing this, I suddenly realized how useful it would be. And I, I've, I've, I've looked around for some sight reading tools and I think that they're not very good yet and I think that would you could have a really wonderful fun guitar like a guitar hero for a real guitar zero thing where I mean I was I didn't show it yet but I'm starting to get a space invaders thing like defender thing so that you're playing and then this the bars come across but we could easily do that having the notes come down and you just have to find them and um, I think we should embrace this with fun and abandon and in all sort of sorts of ways. I mean, my use of guitar and technology previously has been for um, microtiming. Mm. That's really what I've been into, sort of revealing those aspects. But I don't see why this couldn't be used for all levels of, of, um, of sight reading chord reading all sorts of things like that yeah, be presumably it would be uh, easy to adapt for uh, non-equally tempered systems and a uh, natural overtone series and all sorts of things yeah good point i mean there is a um uh right now i'm just playing an even tempered instrument mm -hmm. but that instrument could be uh, just intonated in any way but also the uh, 
uh, MIDI. It's in a basic system. I mean, it's 20 years old, it's GI20 now, but it sends quite accurate pitch bend data as well. So you could, um, you could do it for practicing bends and have that visualized as well. And that's fascinating. Does it work with a slide with a bottleneck or does it respond to the pressure that you put on the, on the string? Okay, so the, um, it's, okay, so it's basically a, a six microphones that pick it up and they mm -hmm. hear the pitch and then they respond. What makes it unique is there's six channels, basically. Yeah, so right, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, it, it, it will respond to, uh, it'll respond to pitch changes, like you said. It'll send, so long as I set it up correctly, it'll send a, um, a part, a, uh, floating number for between I know it's a pitch bend data that it sends between the between each fretted note. Uh, right now I think I've turned it off so that it's simply um, just moves up to the next step but yeah. yes that's a good idea those are all really good um, you could add concepts. quarter tone frets you know you could have quarter yeah tone. that's a really that's a really good idea I'm going to think about that anyway thank you so much Milton okay. thank you um, so just a quick note we're going to be kicked off the stream at in 10 minutes because we're only allowed to stream for eight hours so if we get cut off we'll just go to the chat to continue great Ethan, uh, do you have a question uh yeah if I, if I can ask uh so this was fantastic thank you so much um I, I guess my question is a little bit beyond the, the obvious pedagogical and creative practicing import that this has. Have you thought of ways in which you can integrate it into kind of like a multimedia live performance art piece? I know live performance is a, is a sore subject. No, no. I, but like, I, 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 I just have metal bands that have synced. Uh, I do a lot with metal and they often play to like, you know, pre-existing tracks and they have their lights synced up to, uh, you, you know, whatever track they're playing. So I'm just curious. It, it, yeah, it, that's, I I've thought about this a lot. And um, when I used to play guitar in front of humans, um, the, uh, I had this project called Rat Park and we, it was basically this guitar and drums and bass and Ableton Live. And uh, we uh, did all sorts of crazy things. Like I had um, adjective nouns prepositions on each string and then different ones so i could spell out poetry live that was projected and um, also this with this i have a i haven't shown it but i can actually split the audio so you can have not just midi but audio panned around so an arpeggiation goes all your tetra all your cubes could be actually realized uh, around in space um, and of course now you can just send MIDI data to lighting systems and they respond really fast. So yeah, I'm totally into the synesthetic uh, performance of all that. Um, I also made some animated characters and if you bent, the mouth opens. So it was like a little kind of guitar avatars that would that would respond. Yeah, so it's I, I can't wait to do such things again, but... Um, and I like the idea of distributed performances, like having each string of a Bach prelude being the basis of a um, even different rooms or broadcasts. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. Um, if not, um, I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned in the middle of your um, session that when you picked up the left-handed guitar, you had this idea, this is dissonance. And I was curious whether you had the same dissonance when you were developing this. Oh, so absolutely. I mean, the, the left-handed guitar was actually the joy of trying to play upside down and feeling mm -hmm. um, just mismatching, mm -hmm. you know, what it feels like having a walking bass low down to the floor and how ingrained you know the the delicious burn of that of it not working out how you wanted to but yeah this is like um a steroided version of that <laughs> experience it's hard to explain because it probably comes across you know sort of detached but what it actually feels like even to have it tuned in fourths and not to come out how you you think and i have to it hurts just to play a major triad arpeggio across that break yeah it, it you you understand it because i've done so much to accommodate that um so um i, I you know i discovered recently that it, um, there's a tic-tac-toe rule when we speak 
when there are words that are similar, we tend to do it in the uh, like hip hop and pitter patter. We don't say patter pitter or hop hip. It feels completely wrong. But I wasn't aware of such a um, invisible constraint that we have. And that break in the string is so deeply embedded that um, I'm, you know, Ant Law, I don't know, he, he's basically built his whole system around that. And he says that it makes impossible things sound really, um, really easy and uh, very easy and basic things almost impossible to play. And that's, uh, I think it's a good thing for us. I think actually, you now going back to standard tuning, I feel so much more solidified in my understanding even just playing with this for a, a couple of weeks you think it would confuse but it does the opposite actually it sort of strengthens and it takes away the stress because I've now played every single bad note <laughs> I've basically got buckets of avoid notes you know you can just have the strings changing every beat and it's actually quite liberating and you just focus on groove and gesture and that's um, and you realize how important they are like a two five one, it didn't really matter. I do two five one, and I mess up the um, strings completely, and I get um, um, and it's nice. It is two five one still. It has that identity, even though it's completely wrong. So it shows that pitch isn't isn't the primary um, expressive medium. Really, it's just a good one. This was such a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much for being here.